So coming back to functional safety management, as I said before, this governs the whole life cycle, not just one of the phases, but all three of the phases. And it's all about making sure that we allocate life cycle responsibilities properly. Now, what do I mean by properly? The standard now requires roles and responsibilities to be defined. So it's not just a question of having a, an organization chart with, with Joe's name in there for being responsible for the PSM. If he doesn't know, number one, he is responsible for that, or number two, he's not competent to be responsible for that. So this is another thing that was added into the um, 2016 change. <clears throat> so we have to develop, of course, procedures. So not just roles and responsibilities, there have to be procedures in place. And we have to make sure our people are competent. So I, my, my, my own personal view of what competency is, it's a blend of knowledge, experience and capability. That's the way I look at it. You've got to have the knowledge in the first place, but you need to have the experience to know how to apply that knowledge. So that's the important part. And here again, there are too many problems where people are not properly competent and qualified. So purpose of functional safety management, one of the primary purposes, it's not the only purpose, but one of the primary purposes is to help us ensure that we can manage the systematic risks. So there are specific considerations that we have to look at. Roles and responsibilities, number one. Competency, number two. Clear identification of the hazards. So in other words, we have had to do the hazard and risk analysis properly. <clears throat> Any recommendations and follow-ups and how we would resolve those. So it's not just, you can't just now do a, a, a hazard and risk assessment, put a recommendation in and forget about it. It has to be followed up. I mean, we ended up coming to do a PHA, and this was the third PHA. So this was year 15, and the same recommendation was still there from the first one. That's not acceptable. And <clears throat> this is why there's more focus on this. We have to define the activities, not just for one phase, but for all the phases. Now, for example, if you subcontract the SRS to a third party, or if you subcontract the SIS design to a third party, how do you know that they're competent to do what they claim they can do? And the standard now says that, th that they themselves, if they're claiming to offer any product or service that's uh, functional safety related, they have to also demonstrate that they have proper functional safety management in place and that their people are competent to do the work. So this again is another um, change in the standard to beef up this requirement. <clears throat> so it's not just suppliers of products but also of services. And we also need to put in validation procedures. So that at various stages we will verify, we'll do verification to make sure that the work has been done but to validate that means we have to make sure that the final product meets all the requirements that we've actually achieved what we said we were going to do so functional safety assessments and functional safety audits how are we going to do those and what tools are we going to use so again it's interesting <clears throat> with the excellencia tool we have had the uh, Markov model calculation engine assessed to SIL 3 independently. So we know that what comes out of that model is good up to SIL 3. We can rely on it. Because otherwise, if you're using a software tool that you don't know if it's been validated properly or not, it could be a case of, if you make a mistake, it could be garbage in but gospel out because now you're believing what the tool's telling you, even though it's generating the wrong thing. So this is another important thing, and that's why that's in there. Audit procedures. How often are we going to audit? What do we do to follow up on the audits? 
and then management of change, how we handle management of change, very important. And then for the CIS configuration itself, how are we going to manage the configuration changes? So there needs to be procedures in place for that, and we need to make sure we're following these things. The best way, <clears throat> and the way I like to characterize the systematic issues, is think of it as the three Ps. So let me just uh, go over and show you what I mean by that. So, if you see here, we talk about the three Ps. We're talking about three Ps. So what's the first one? The first P, P number one, is people. So this is all about making sure that our people are properly trained, properly qualified, properly competent to do this. P number two is procedure. Do we have the procedures in place and are they being followed? Because that's the other problem. If the procedures are not being followed, then what's the point of having the procedure? And then P number three, paperwork. Do we have a paper trail, an audit trail, that shows that we're following what we said we were going to follow? Because if we don't, then we're obviously going to have problems. So this is very important. So the systematic is all about managing the three Ps, making sure that our people are competent, properly trained. That's why this is in the standard. That means roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. There's no ambiguity. There's no misunderstanding. Everybody knows what their role is and what's required of them. Very important. The second is to make sure that we have procedures. And again, the procedure, it's not, the quality is not in the thickness of the procedure. It's how easily it is to understand and follow the procedure so that we won't make any mistakes. And then, of course, the third P is all about making sure that we document correctly, that we have a paper trail, we have an audit trail, so we can go back and do appropriate investigation of any issues or problems.